If you wanted to grow a bit of food in a vegetable garden, or to learn the basics of a language to get by while traveling, or to be able to play a few tunes on a guitar, just getting in and trying can be a great way to start. But if you wanted or needed to become highly skilled, fluent, or proficient, it takes practice, immersion, and in a lot of cases a focused exploration or learning path can help. If I wanted to learn a foreign language quite quickly, there's a number of different structured paths that I could take, including courses or apps or even programs of direct immersion. But we tend not to think about this in relation to how we might go about learning how to grow food. How do we go from knowing only a little bit about growing, or with limited practical experience, to having the skills, experience, and knowledge to be able to consistently grow an abundance of high-quality vegetables, especially if you wanted or needed to do this quickly? I've been thinking about this for a while, and it seems that there's a number of different strategies or approaches, ways of getting started, or at least thinking about the different paths that you might take towards a goal of becoming a skilled grower of vegetables. Of course, the most obvious approach is to simply start a garden and grow a wide range of vegetables. This is what a lot of people do and what I did when I started. For some people, this can be the best way to go about it and they can have a lot of success with it. But others seem to struggle with this approach, including myself. While I made it through this phase of a lot more failure or mediocre results than successes, I've seen so many other people give up. Beyond the basic lack of skills and attention, there can be just too much information, too many potentially conflicting or inappropriate ideas or options, which can make things quite complicated, and this can increase the likelihood of failing. Of course, this isn't always the case, and I suspect that people who adopt a particular approach or style, or follow the advice of one gardening expert or a single book, may have more success. Assuming that the approach is actually appropriate to the context and climate, and they have access to the resources or materials needed by the method, this limiting of focus and advice can be quite useful. And they tend to offer a holistic view or approach, often based on a few fundamental ideas that people can really grab onto. For example, this seems to be what inspires many people to follow various no-dig methods, with a focus on protecting the soil ecosystem, as well as reducing heavy workload. Other people are inspired by the challenge to grow as much as possible, or to create honeybee and biodiversity friendly gardens, or to preserve heritage vegetable varieties and save seeds, to focus on education, community development and mental health, or to explore a particular unusual method. All of these can be great ways to focus and inspire, to keep people going at the task. And they can also be distracting from other goals, such as gaining the skills of being able to produce high quality vegetables. They can also encourage people into echo chambers, potentially restricting awareness of the diversity of different options that there are out there, possibly preventing the exploration of various methods that might be more appropriate. A very different but not incompatible approach to learning how to grow food is to prioritize growing high value vegetables. Price is an obvious factor here, and it makes a lot of sense to focus on growing things that will cost the most elsewhere but it also makes sense to grow what isn't readily available, or not good enough quality, or fresh enough. This approach to limiting crops generally means avoiding staple or traditional vegetables like cabbages, onions, carrots, or potatoes, which form a big part of many diets, as they are often readily available quite cheaply. Growing only what is most valuable makes a lot of sense with small growing spaces, and it can offer a quicker return on any investment. I think it can also be a very useful way to limit the scope and focus of a garden when starting out. A common approach is to start by focusing on lettuce and other salad greens, and even growing peas which always seem to taste much better when freshly picked. More crops can of course be added in time, especially as skills, capacity and space increases, but avoiding growing a lot of crops for the first while may actually help you get there faster. Another version of growing only high value crops is to start small, very very small. I think that microgreens could be a great way to start learning how to grow your own food, because the succession cropping of these very fast growing greens means that failure or disappointment in one batch is not such an issue, especially compared to so many other crops where you need to wait until the following year to try again. With a few months of growing microgreens, you can go through many cycles of learning and adaptation, of trial and error, or experimenting with different methods. In the meanwhile, these quick crops offer opportunities to develop routines and observation skills, adapt useful techniques, and to try numerous different methods quickly. They are a great way to fail faster, and they are a very easy crop to scale up and can be grown even without access to land. 
Perhaps most importantly, microgreens can supply something to eat right away, or even to sell, while building capacity to grow at a larger scale, or when waiting for that opportunity. Another option for starting out by narrowing the focus of what you grow is by tackling a relatively tricky crop first, rather than the quick and easy ones. I think that growing a crop like carrots could perhaps be the best choice for this deeper exploration of learning and skill building. In order to consistently grow a good crop of carrots in my experience, the soil needs to be adequately cultivated with balanced levels of fertility and cleared of excessive amounts of stones. Germination of the tiny seeds depends on good quality seed, a fine seed bed, warm enough soil, consistent moisture levels, and they can't be sown too deeply. Once germinated, the seedlings need to be protected from slugs, and then thinned and kept weed free, and in many places the crop needs to be protected from carrot root fly and other pests. The plants can't be too stressed by extreme weather conditions while growing, and then they need to be harvested at an appropriate time and, if necessary, stored well. Individually, these tasks or skills are not necessarily difficult, but if you can consistently grow good crops of different types of carrots, then a lot of these skills you would develop are transferable to other crops. And the soil that you're growing in is probably well developed and cleaned. Depending on the variety selection, the growing conditions, and the soil fertility, you might end up with really great tasting carrots, or not. And that is something that can be the focus of exploration, or trying different variations and methods. Of course, it doesn't have to be only carrots, but by focusing on growing multiple batches of this trickier crop for a few seasons can really help to develop useful skills and knowledge. And it helps that it is a vegetable that most people like, and it's quite versatile and stores well, without the glut of other popular summer crops. Reducing the focus of what you're trying to grow as a way of structuring the process of learning can also be tied in with the gradual development of the growing space and easing into the workload. One option is to prepare one bed in the first season and to grow only one crop. The next season, prepare another bed for the same crop and grow the second crop in the original bed. Then each season after that, continue to prepare an additional bed or section of the growing space, and add another crop, rotating the others to the next bed as the space expands. And if you know the plan for future seasons, then work can begin well in advance to prepare the soil rather than trying to convert it into a growing space in the rush of the spring. This is essentially the basis of the simple garden method that I've been developing, which begins with squash growing over sheet composting hidden under ground cover fabric. The next season, the soil is dug and planted with potatoes, and after harvesting, the bed can be established for growing carrots, or other crops that can benefit from cleaner and well-developed soil. Each season, the squash is growing in a new piece of ground, with the other crops following in a carefully designed rotation, incorporating whatever soil-improving methods make sense for the context. It does take a few seasons to expand the garden to its full size, but the process can be designed to make it all quite easy and productive, and less prone to the struggles of taking on too much. All of these methods of limiting the scope or focus of what you're trying to grow can have definite benefits, but there's one key downside in that they can all take just too long. Sometimes it's better to try to develop the skills and capacity as quickly as possible, to commit a lot of time and resources to the process of learning, and to make sure that you get lots of food as soon as possible. I think the best way of doing this is to try growing with a range of different methods in parallel, which is essentially what I've been trying to do the last number of years with the family scale gardens in this Red Gardens project. Setting up different gardens that use different methods, trying out a lot of different approaches and options, and growing a full range of crops in each one offers great opportunities to explore and learn. It does demand a lot of work, time, and focus, requiring good planning and record keeping, but if you have the time, space, and opportunity, it can be a really valuable, immersive experience. Assuming that you don't struggle or abandon the project due to taking on too much, it can also be a lot more resilient overall, as a failure with one crop in one garden can be offset by the redundancy of the same crops growing in the other gardens. None of this is meant as advice, but to explore a number of different ways to approach the process that so you might learn how to grow your own food, or to grow food for others. Just diving in and working to develop the garden that you want right away is an appropriate option, especially if you already have some skills and experience and are the kind of person who can focus on the necessary tasks and see things through. 
It helps if you have really detailed advice to follow that is appropriate for your context, and even better if you're inspired by a deeper set of values or ethos. On the other hand, limiting the focus to particular methods or crops can be really useful, especially for people who don't have the time or capacity to engage fully, or don't yet have adequate space to grow in, but still want to start the process of learning and skilling up. Linking the development of the physical growing space to the gradual building up of skills relating to growing different crops can be another option, especially when it's part of a carefully designed system of rotation or progression. But if you wanted to quickly develop the skills, experience, and knowledge to be able to consistently grow an abundance of high-quality vegetables, and you need to be self-sufficient in vegetables as soon as possible, a deep dive is the best option in my experience. Trialing a range of different methods in parallel growing spaces was the origin of this Red Gardens project, and with the mix of struggles and successes along the way, I have learned so much. More importantly, it has allowed me to diversify my skills and experience in the gardens, and it's encouraged me to keep an open mind about what methods might be the best ones to use. And in the process, I've grown a lot of food, and thankfully the quality keeps getting better.